on 365 Sports, but also in the studio with Craig and Paul and myself, David Smoke, is Kendall Kalp, Baylor in Kansas tonight. When they were 0-3, did you think this was a game to get to 5-3, and or was this a game to maybe get back to 500? You know, Smokey, I always like to think I'm optimistic, but I'm also pretty pessimistic in life, so... In my worst moments, I would have said, no way, sell the farm, it's over. You read the people that say, NIT, why are we even suggesting that? I think those thoughts cross your mind. But I did think it was possible for them to do this with how well the offense is played. And it's really hard to not get to good with the staff that good and with still Keontae George, Adam Flagler, and LJ Cryer on your roster. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, um, a bear of a league. I mean, it's just going to it's gonna be tough every night. Even the, even the teams that are struggling are, are still good uh, when it comes right down to it. Uh, so how much of the, I mean, if you take the Iowa state game as kind of the outlier of like, okay, everybody's going to have one where they get stomped and they did, they got worked by that. You have two, uh, one possession losses, and then you have this four game winning streak. So are they really about right where they should be based on how everybody else is in this league? I think they're in an appropriate spot to still contend for the big 12 title, Paul. Yeah. I think there's an argument that they've had some setbacks maybe they shouldn't have had earlier in the season. They should never have lost to Marquette by as many points as they did. That defensive effort, not acceptable for Baylor, and I think they recognize that. But I think pretty clearly right now those top six in the league that include Baylor, TCU, Iowa State, KU, uh, and K-State among that six, along with Texas, have really separated themselves from that bottom four. And even that bottom four, I mean, Bob Huggins, you can talk about is he maybe on the hot seat or not. I hope not with how successful he's been. But if Bob Huggins is coaching this West Virginia squad in the ACC, we're maybe talking about them contending for an ACC title and not finishing ninth in such a great league. So what's the, been the biggest difference between 0-3 and, and now, you know, 4-0? and Craig, I think it's that the offense has gone to another level. Uh, Bart Torvik, uh, kind of a cousin of Ken Palm in the sense that they do very similar stuff, has a metric where you can go onto his site and pick from a starting date to an ending date. And over the seven Big 12 games, which – even includes that Iowa State debacle where Baylor's offense wasn't effective. Flagler in the first half, Keontae in the second half, nothing in between. Baylor's had the nation's number one offense by a full three points per 100 possession, which is a pretty monumental gap. But even in that stretch, Baylor's 172nd on defense. So it's been the testament of, can your offense carry if your defense is bad enough? If Baylor can just get the defense to confident, they really can contend once again for Houston on that final weekend of the season. Yeah, but the, the, the offense was a little sickly on Saturday. Was that Oklahoma or a bad day shooting? I think it was a bad day shooting, Smokey. Oklahoma got out in their faces, but I didn't think Oklahoma did anything better than K-State or TCU did or that Texas Tech really even did. And Lubbock, I think Baylor just had an off shooting night. I believe Matt Roberts, the great Baylor SID, sent out a stat saying that that was Baylor's worst shooting performance in a win in the last three seasons. So good testament that Baylor could play some defense beyond just their foray into Sioux Falls, but have to get the offense back on steam, and then the defense needs to keep itself at at least that level. What do you think they are, I mean, outside of having lockdown guards, which they don't really have anymore, but they were spoiled in that regard for a little while. Outside of that, because they didn't have those guys last year either, but they were still really good on defense, so for the most part of the season. What are they missing on defense? I think, uh, Paul, we don't have time to go through everything there. Yeah. Scott, yes. But it's a good question because it's like, what are the one or two things that Baylor could really hone in on? I think at some point, because Baylor's wings aren't really that long other than Jalen Bridges, and they don't like to play Caleb and Jalen together because the offense suffers. LJ and Adam aren't the best point of the attack defenders, like maybe a Davion Mitchell or a James Akenjo, as much as I like both the pair I just described. I think they've got to get better about understanding assignment defense and saying, you know what, if tonight Dewan Harris takes 10 threes and makes six, Sometimes the dice don't come up your way in Vegas or if, you know, you don't like gambling. Uh, insert your analogy for gambling there if, if people are anti-gambling. But I think they've got to pick their spots better, decide who you can leave open, and understand that they're not going to get to perfect, but good is good enough. Has it, that struggle been surprising to you? And how surprising do you think it's been to the staff that maybe they're struggling as much as they are on that end versus expectations? Good series of questions for everybody on that front, Craig. I think it's been surprising to them that they've been this bad. I think coming in, you look at kind of a pre-mortem. There's the concept if you're a doctor before a surgery, they look at what's everything that could go wrong that would kill the patient. And they found studies that look at that and say, that's a pretty accurate method to know what are the things we can actually prevent. Coming into this season, Baylor's staff, I think, was very cognizant. Offense is going to be really good. I had one member of the staff tell me they thought the offense could be better than the championship team. And you mm -hmm. look at the metrics right now, it actually has been. But they thought that defense could be really bad, and it has been. So I think it's shocked them that it's been this bad to this degree. And they've spent so much time correcting it. And after the loss in Milwaukee, they flew down to South Dakota immediately after, prepared hours and hours. I think they were still sleeping three hours a night that first evening because Scott Drew would call them up and say, we're meeting again, we're meeting again, we're meeting again. So 
it's shocking they're this bad. It was a problem they identified, but even when you identify a problem, there are degrees of harm, and that's been one heck of a degree of harm for Baylor. When you have Jonathan Chamwachachua and Mark Vidal as those around you in the middle, and especially on defense, Flo had protection and vice versa. Does he miss that kind of person? I think absolutely, Smokey. You look at Baylor's defense last year, and even what you're talking about sort of with the alpha dog personalities of Jonathan Chamwachachua. One of the great things about the COVID season well, I know I saw a lot of you that year. That was great, too. Another great thing about it, though, was without a lot of fans in the stadiums, you could really hear who talks on the court. And Jonathan Chamwa Chachua, you could hear shouting in his Cameroonian accent, you know, ice, ice, ice. I'm not going to do the accent to offend anybody on the show. We love Cameroon at 365 Sports and Sikkim 365. <laughs> um, but you could hear Jonathan Chamwa Chachua really shouting everything out and screaming it out. And I don't know that you've heard kind of that same intensity. I think one thing we underrated last year, and we've seen it now in the NBA and in that North Carolina game, is that Jeremy Sohan, was really a dog out there on the floor. He wasn't afraid to get down and get dirty. And they don't really have a guy like that. You know, that's nice. You talk to people on the staff, and they're like, we like working with these guys. But sometimes you do need a guy who can get a little bit mean when things aren't going your way. Maybe Keontae George is that guy, but they don't really have that alpha personality or that elite athleticism you talked about in your question, Smokey. Oh, uh, Jeremy Sohan, like, you um, you knew it. Like, from the actually this game last year was like when the whole, well, maybe he comes back for a year ended. When he played against Kansas and did what he did and pretty much brought them back, that was the start of like, well, don't get attached. You know, like he, he's going to be gone. Uh, yeah, they don't have anybody. It's not like you can just go get somebody who's not only uh, like aggressively and like the dog, but good at it too. There's plenty of guys who bark, but he had bite as well. Absolutely. Jeremy Sohan, they thought would be good. I don't know that even Jeremy Sohan thought he'd be that good. I think he thought he was coming to the U.S. and coming to Baylor for two years after playing in Europe. So he was ahead of schedule. That does impact them a little bit. Still real happy getting Keontae George. Jalen Bridges has really turned it on lately. Mm. But that's been a loss for Baylor that I think they probably expected. They're doing a two-year roster plan ahead. He'd be around still this year. I was going to ask you about Jalen Bridges. What's kind of clicking for him? I know this is a lot more of what was expected when he had committed versus maybe what we saw origin, you know, right out of the gate. So, so why is he having the impact that he's having now? I think it's a combination of – I've talked to a few people about this, Craig – and I was talking to some folks uh, in early January, and I was just like, you know what? I, I know you all say he makes these shots in practice, but <laughs> he's making these shots in practice. Why is he shooting 15% from three? Am I getting spun <laughs> here? I, I don't need to be spun like this. You, you spin me your other lies. Had a lot of West Virginia fans like, told you, told yeah. you, see? Yeah. 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 Craig, I hadn't seen, uh, you know, I don't want to insult our West Virginia listeners either. We've got great <laughs> West Virginia listeners. We love the Big 12. Um, but they were out there in our mentions, and so that wasn't great for it. I think he, he's kind of taking the pressure off of himself. I talked to some folks that said, in practice, he'll make 16 out of 23s before they'll leave. And they felt like he almost was feeling too much pressure between I got to be that guy who left Morgantown and can be good at Baylor. And I don't know if it was once the West Virginia game happened or once he got a little bit more comfortable as I'm not the guy in West Virginia playing for West Virginia anymore. But there's no way Jalen Bridges probably even takes those shots he took at the end of the Oklahoma game. And for him to make all three of those shots, absolutely different guy. And that's the guy they expected and they're getting. So the uh, the Scott was on last week, and he said the rotation's already kind of cut from eight nine to eight. Who could penetrate that if anyone that's not playing right now? At least if they need somebody to to take up some minutes. I think the two are the question that remains on the table: Will Jonathan Chamwachach will play this sure. season? And then the second one is: Could Dale Bonner play a little bit more going down the stretch? I think there will come a game where one of the guards will get into some foul trouble or Caleb Lohner might get blown by a few times. I, I hope it doesn't happen for Caleb. Seems like a nice cat. But somewhere along this, the line, I think, this season, there will be a moment Dale Bonner is needed. I do think the rotation probably stays close to eight for most of the year, but there will be a game where Dale Bonner is needed down the stretch to win a game they'll need. Kendall Count with us. He is, uh, again, our college basketball analyst for Sikkim 365 and also 365 Sports. All right, so Kansas rolls in tonight, and this is a team that's on a two-game skid, which doesn't happen often under Bill Self. Three-game skids happen less often than that. Um, but this is a little bit of a different Kansas team right now in that their starters are really good, but only one of them has been super consistent in Jalen Wilson, and they don't have much of a bench right now. Um, do you think this is a, a Kansas team that's a little shaken on confidence, which, again, under Bill Self, They've never really not been confident. I think it's possible, uh, Paul. Everything you mentioned is definitely true. I looked it up before coming here to be like, you know, am I incorrect in this assessment? They just don't play their bench at all nationally, or has it trended that way? Per Ken Palm, they're 344th in minutes played by their bench, so they just don't go to the bench at all. And so if you want to insert an MJ Rice or an Ernest Uda or a Zuby Ejiofor, well, they haven't really played up to this point, and you're going to have their first game of the season be what I think will be a very raucous environment tonight for Big Monday in Waco. 
So we'll see how it goes. Dewan Harris, I think, has only scored like three points in his last four games. Hasn't really found a shot recently. Kevin McCullough has gotten beat more often than he ever did in Lubbock. Jalen Wilson would be the Big 12 player of the year if the season ended today. But other than that, Paul, I'm a little questionable about how does KU feel tonight coming into this one. And that's why if you're Baylor, you really need to win this one if you think you're a Big 12 title contender. I, I'm telling you, that game in Norman, which was touch and go, obviously you lose that, you're three and four, then you're having Kansas. So uh, Paul Catalina's uh, got emotional issues tonight at the Farrell Center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got uh, got two I, emotional issues. I got two, two of them sleeping in my house. One, one will leave tomorrow. But the both of them might leave tomorrow. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but the uh, surprisingly, the one who can uh, who will be a- angrier about it is the one who's not. So um, yeah, it's tough. I told Scott Drew that like, look, if you win, I got my bag packed. I'm staying at your house for a couple days. Hope they, you got honey nut Cheerios. They got <laughs> destroyed by TCU. That was never. I was playing golf. Paul texted me. He was like. I, I looked at the scores like 17, 15. When they got it down to 10, I'm thinking, okay, here comes KU. They never made the run. They didn't smoke you, and that's the staple of KU throughout their history. I always compare it to their that West Virginia game about four or five years ago where Bob Huggins afterwards went absolutely apoplectic, saying, you're playing, you know, eight against five in this arena. What happens now on Fieldhouse? But you always feel like in that building, KU will make the run. I think back in 2018, Baylor was up at like six with two minutes left, and then you can argue, did a call not go their way? Did they have a bad turnover? But it always seems like KU can manufacture something there. And to just get kind of punched in the mouth by Eddie Lampkin, Mike Miles to go off, TCU to get shoot so well, that didn't feel like a vintage Kansas team. And so coming into tonight, Baylor feels like they're going to establish themselves as a Big 12 contender. That's what they're playing for. And KU, I think, feels like they're playing for the pride of all the Jayhawk teams that came before them. There's not a lot of guys who have kind of the star power that Keontae George had coming in. And so I feel like anytime we talk, i got to ask you just kind of progress report on, on what you've seen from him. Uh, where have you seen his game kind of go these last few weeks? Where do you see him as we get into the, the real meat of the Big 12 play now? Craig, I think it's an understanding of picking his spots a little bit better than they were in the beginning of the season. Now, they'll let Keontae take that turnaround jumper he did at the end of the OU game that you're like, yeah. ooh, or some of those off-balance threes. You live with those because Keontae George is a – what you might consider a bad shot maker. He makes those at an elite level, kind of a la Carmelo Anthony back in his Syracuse days. What I've been most impressed with him is how he's gotten his emotions in check. He absolutely lives and dies with it. There have been some one and dones that have come through Baylor where, you know, at times you wonder, hey, are they thinking about where am I going to sign my next check? Who's my agent going to be? What am I going to do with that? After the Virginia game, I was out in Vegas and looked across the court at Keontae. And at the Iowa State game, I was right near the Baylor bench. I've never seen a freshman show that kind of emotional intensity for Baylor. And somebody on the staff that I talked to last week told me he's been absolutely awesome to be around. And that's helped his development a lot because Keontae George isn't stupid. Uh, he knows he's going to be a millionaire next year and he's going to be playing in the NBA. And so it'd be real easy to kind of disassociate yourself right. because I think sometimes when I struggle in life, I think, oh, this thing doesn't matter or I'll stop caring about it less so it won't hurt so much. But Keontae embraces the pain, embraces the suffering. Maybe that's a hashtag, embrace the suffering. And that's how Baylor's gotten to 4-3 and three from 0-3. Would we think differently of who they were, not just because their record would be 5-2, and two, if they would have won either one of the home games against Kansas State or TCU? I think we would, Smokey. And that's what's so kind of frustrating about college basketball is, is Baylor really any that better or worse if TCU doesn't make a crazy three? Or if Ishmael doesn't make a low percentage three at the end of that game? I mean, they're... Six and one, potentially, then. And that's what's so funny about basketball. I mean, Texas has to decide if they want to hire Rodney Terry, who, on paper, is going to have a pretty good resume. But it could be goofy enough that if Rodney Terry plays, let's say, an underseeded North Carolina in a 3-6 game, and Caleb Love and R.J. Davis remember what they remembered against Baylor in the NCAA tournament, are you not going to hire Rodney Terry because they go 11 of 20 from three? Or if North Carolina shoots poorly, and then you make the Elite Eight, do you hire him? But those are the kind of minuscule distinctions that make up life. But at some level, that's life in and of itself. You you meet a girl at a stoplight, you wouldn't have seen her otherwise if you'd taken a left turn. I mean, sometimes life works out for you, sometimes it doesn't. For Rodney Terry's sake, I hope he meets the girl at the stoplight, and I hope Texas, you know, wins for him except when they're playing Baylor. What an analogy. What an analogy. <laughs> <laughs> great, and that makes sense, too. I'm still waiting for the girl at the stoplight, guys. So that's why it's on my mind. <laughs> well, look, stoplight's not usually the place where you pick up chicks, I don't think. And that could be my problem. Yeah. Especially <laughs> if you take the left turn. Yeah. <laughs> Kendall, go enjoy the game. I know you'll uh, enjoy it and cover it, and we'll have full reports from you following and, and then articles and all the stuff, the shrapnel of good or bad afterwards, right? Uh, always a pleasure, fellas. I really love the studio and really love how you all have grown and what you all are doing now, and I'm proud of what you all are going to do into the future. Thank you, Kendall. You too. We're glad you're a part of what we do. Kendall Cout covers Baylor men's basketball with us and is a...